uh, always a very exciting time of year as we're winding down the spring semester and moving into the final presentations. Uh, this year, obviously a little different. Um, I wish I could be standing on a podium somewhere uh, in front of you guys, I really do. Um, but of course, everything, everything's a little different uh, in our lives. Um, but regardless, we're pretty happy to be presenting the 2020 Madison College Challenge, which is our eighth con consecutive year. Uh, we've been able to host this competition and award cash prizes. And uh, so we're proud of that, but also really grateful to our sponsors. Uh, thank you, Summit Credit Union. Thank you, folks at TASC, for making it possible. Um, just a little bit of context, even before COVID-19 hit, this year's competition was going to be a little different than in years past. Uh, after seven years of doing it really a specific way, uh, we changed up the format a little bit, really in an effort to engage more directly with several of our program areas across the college. So historically, we required participants to submit a full business plan, uh, which for folks not studying business or who haven't done this uh, can be pretty daunting. But this year, we set a goal to more actively seek out really some of the best ideas around campus and I put those through a rather intense several weeks of coaching. Uh, and in this case, they received seven weeks of coaching from, from Scott primarily. Um, so this is the culminating exercise. Uh, you get to see the pitch decks uh, and their executive summaries today. So we're excited about that. Um, I do want to say that all of us that work in the Center for Entrepreneurship, uh, to all of you students, uh, teams, uh, we're really proud of all of you uh, that went through this. You guys have stuck with it in spite of some highly challenging circumstances. And uh, I think it would have been easy for some of you to throw in the towel and I'm sure a few of you considered it, um, but you didn't and you made it to the end. And that is certainly the essence of entrepreneurship, perseverance and overcoming obstacles. So, so very excited to see your presentations uh, today. And uh, with that, why don't we do a quick round of introductions for our judges. Um, it will be me, Julie, Don, and Jill today. Um, so I will start. For those of you that don't know me, uh, Brian Woodhouse. I'm Associate Vice President for Strategic Partnerships and Innovation. I oversee continuing education, digital badging, workforce development, um, and our early college endeavors, along with the Center for Entrepreneurship. And I've uh, been at Madison College for 10 years now, so it's been great. Um, excited for year eight of the challenge. Jill, you want to do a quick introduction? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Jill Heisinga. I'm the program director for Small Business Entrepreneurship Program and the faculty director for the Center for Entrepreneurship. And I'm excited to hear your pitches today. Thanks, Jill. Dawn, welcome. Um, hi everyone, Dawn Mortimer here. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at um, actually at TASC. I was actually on the first um, Madison College uh, Innovation Challenge when I was the Innovation Director at American Family. And I'm super excited to hear all the great pitches today. I've read uh, most of your perspectives and you guys have got some great opportunities in front of us. Awesome. Thanks, Dawn. Welcome back. You bet. Uh, Julie, welcome. Thanks for having me. So I am Julie Spitzek. I am Vice President Business Services at Summit Credit Union and been in that role for 13 years and been in the banking world for 30. Uh, my favorite part of my job is actually reading business plans and hearing pitches. So I'm always excited to participate in this and hear some innovative ideas. And yeah, I've read through everything and there's some really interesting concepts there. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. Welcome back too. This is your second or third time judging with us. It's great. Glad to have you. Uh, Gina, good morning. Welcome. You're judging with us too. <laughs> good morning. I'm Gina Stevens, one of the entrepreneurs in residence. I also own the company Belwa Media um, here in Madison. I am the board chair of Collaboration for Good which is a social good accelerator in Madison. So I'm interested in um, the folks here who are doing their pitches today. And um, I also started a, um, an accelerator and incubator in Rock County for uh, black business owners. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Gina. Good to see you. 
Uh, Scott, you want to do a quick intro as well? Good morning, everyone. And yes, I, it's good to see Don again after many years. We overlapped at AmFam for a short period of time. So um, just want to say like everyone here really persevered. It was, it was a tough kind of like eight weeks. Um, I held people to task. And what's exciting is a lot of, of our entrepreneurs, they were just at idea stage. Like they just had this thing in their mind that kind of kept them up at night. So they were starting from really, really far back. So what you're seeing is just the beginning of their journey. They're only gonna get better. Um, but in just a short period of time, many of them have made super huge leaps and discovered a lot. So it's pretty cool just, you know, how far we've come over Zoom meetings and, you know, Tuesday meetings in the morning and evening. But I'm um, really proud of everyone for the effort and, uh, you know, just the creativity that they've shown over the past few weeks. And it's a privilege to be able to, start the journey with you guys and and the center's still here just because the challenge is over um you can still reach out anytime we're still here to help um there's a long ways to go so stay in touch awesome thanks scott thanks for all your work with these folks too wouldn't have happened without you kelsey you want to do a quick intro good morning everyone i'm kelsey Klosmit, uh coordinator in the center for entrepreneurship i'm i'm excited to hear your presentations this morning i'm also going to be the one operating uh, kind of through your PowerPoints. So let's do it. All right, awesome. Thanks, Kelsey. Okay, so I think we're about ready to get started. A um, couple of logistics. So presenters will have five to seven minutes to, to make their pitch, um, followed by about the same amount of time uh, for judges to ask a few questions, give some feedback, and then we will, we will bang these out uh, one through nine. Um, there will not be, just a clarification, there won't be a, a top prize winner this year. That's part of the changes that we made. Part of COVID-19 changed everything that we had planned, of course. Um, so we really took the approach that we think we're going to need every business startup uh, that can possibly get off the ground as we come out the other side of this. So rather than have just a few people maybe get cash prize, we're going to try and distribute uh, the funding evenly so that each of you can hopefully have an opportunity to get that business uh, off the ground in the months and years to come. So um, so with that, unless there are any questions, uh, judges have a rubric that I believe Scott sent out in advance. We can use that as a, as a guide really. Um, we won't be collecting scores necessarily, but it uh, gives you a guide of, of how uh, the presenters tried to put their deck together and their pitch together um, and some, some guidelines for you on what we were looking for from them. Um, so, are we ready? Okay. So, our first pitch uh, is going to be from Adam Sawadago. Adam, you're up. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Today, uh, my name is Adama Sawadogo. Today, uh, I'm presenting to you Learning Center, which is a tutoring platform and a self education uh, tool. Next. So, we all know that STEMs, STEM, sub STEM subject and uh, especially mathematics are important to us to some degree. But the problem is that we have, like some students have this stigma about mathematics that sometimes you will see, you will hear people say, math is not for me or science is not for me. So along with uh, Madison College Challenge, when I was doing my research, I found the, those problems which are uh, intimidation and those who have, uh, those who are willing to ask for help, they are facing uh, scheduled conflicts and cost and language barriers. Next. So the solution uh, we've come up with is to find a safe environment for learning, which is having people with less authority who can uh, tutor students uh, in a safer way. 
and it's going to be online 24-7, uh, which resolves the problem of uh, schedule conflicts and it is cost effective. Next. So what do we do at Learning Center? So we have an upfront feature, which is uh, a forum open to all users where you can ask questions uh, related to STEM subjects. And the next feature is one-on-one -on -one tutoring. We also have an innovative way of uh, helping students, which is uh, creating groups from two to five, uh, no matter where the student is coming from. And also we have a library uh, with courses from experienced instructors who have uh, uploaded the, the videos on the website. Next. So our business model, our main source of revenue uh, is the tutoring, the one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And the collaboration, like forming study groups, and the videos from the instructors. The Learning Center will receive a commission from uh, those courses that the instructors uh, uploaded. Next. So our main competitors in terms of online materials are Varsity Tutors and Khan Academy. But since we're also targeting uh, on the African uh, ground, we also have computers on the ground uh, which are in-person class-based uh, tutoring classes in Africa. And you can see how uh, those uh, companies are spread on the graph. Next. So we are hoping to start the website by December 2020 and start trials uh, by 2021. And from that time, we'll focus on marketing and doing uh, legal documents. And the official launch is uh, expected to be in January 2022. Next, financials. Learning Center is going to start small. The first quarter is going to require uh, 1,400, but with uh, an expected increase of 200% doubling each uh, quarter for the first two years. Two Next. minutes left. Uh, Tim, I'm the only one in the team for now. My name is Adama Sawadogo again, and I'm, uh, I'm originally from Burkina Faso in West Africa, but I have a mentor uh, who has business background and uh, coding uh, experience who is uh, Usman Kavri with me today. Next. Thank you very much for uh, listening to my speech today. And if you would like to uh, come up with us in this uh, innovative way of tutoring, feel free to do so. Thank you. All right, thank you, Adama. Questions? Well, Adama, I, this is Dawn. Thank you so much. I mean, I will tell you, in this new world of digital learning, um, online tutorial services are going to be going through the roof because so many parents <laughs> um, that have children at home are going crazy because they do not know the new math or science or capabilities. So I think what you've got is a great opportunity of a platform here. Um, I did have a question 
Um, so you identified that this would be a safe environment for learning, that it's 24-7. Um, how will you staff that? Because that seems like that's going to be a lot of people you might need. So something to think about there. Uh, in terms of our staff, we will start, we'll start with, uh, uh, I contact my friends that I know since I'm a tutor. Those will be uh, the one directly uh, linked to the company, but will also open for uh, independent tutors. Uh, we can refer, we can compare that to, uh, as I was mentioning, varsity tutors. They recruit tutors who work for them, but uh, it's just they they receive the training but they work on their own and uh, pay the commission to uh, learning center okay. have you also thought about other revenue sources just something to think about there like you could have um you know on your website you could do some advertising potentially to gain other um, sponsors to help you fund fund the site and also pay for those tutors so it might be like books companies or um, job aid type of things. So um, companies that create opportunities for you. Okay. Adam, I have a, a suggestion for you. Uh, I think it's a, it's a really good concept. Totally agree with Don. This is the kind of thing that's gonna be in high demand um, you know, going forward. You might think about putting out like some lesson plans uh, in the STEM fields that someone could download. Um, I can tell you right now, as a, as a parent who's trying uh, trying to homeschool sort of kids right now, um, you know, uh, this is not a criticism of our school district at all, but I think they're doing everything they can to put out things for our kids to do and keep learning, but. We're continuing to have to find or trying to find other things that we can supplement that with. Um, so if you made, you know, the tutoring services are great and I think there'll be a demand for that. Um, I think if you can put out their downloadable lesson plans uh, that people could just go and, and purchase from you or maybe some of them are free and then you sign up for a subscription, we would probably do that because I've been looking for things and, and you know, there's a chance that our kids could be home for a portion of the fall too. So um, I think there's going to be a lot of demand for, for those kinds of services. Thank you. Adam, this is Jill here. Um, I appreciated the timeline that you gave in your presentation. And as part of that timeline, you had marked legislation. Can you just explain a little bit as to what you meant with that? Um, by legislation, I mean uh, doing the paper, uh, paperwork for uh, like a business registration. Okay. And I'm uh, aiming to resist, register my business in uh, my home country, Burkina Faso. So uh, by legislation, I mean like creating the business in front of, uh, you know, uh, the government, registering the business. Thank you. Um, I had a question along those lines where you're talking about registering it in your home country. I thought that was a really interesting component and you may not be to this point yet, but I think the thing that crossed my mind is whether there'd be any unique hurdles with operating internationally from multiple standpoints, be it accounting or any other, you know, as far as hurdles that you would encounter from that multiple country? Um, at first, I had the thought of registering the, the business in my home country uh, for the reason that I see myself as an international student and I may not have the privileges of Americans, uh, you know, having businesses in the US. So to be honest, I will um, gauge which, which uh, option is the best regarding to where I should uh, register the business. And as I was saying, I will be consulting uh, 
and also I will receive feedback from you. Where is the best, you know, way? What is the best way to uh, do the paperwork for uh, the company? Is it in my country or here? Well, I think you'd have a lot more competition even in the U.S. So I think in your country is is very interesting. You understand the people, you understand the heritage, the culture. I think that's going to be critical. Um, but to that point, the, what's your expansion strategy? Thinking about languages too. You know, um, having to staff people with, of multiple dialects and languages might be, you know, something you want to think about further down the road. Thank you. To stay on schedule, let's move on to the next, please. Okay, thank you, Adama. So next up, we have uh, Michael Flunker and Leanne Kessler. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out, you know, especially the sponsors. You know, because like this is such a trying time. And um, just to keep things simple, you know, because we're on such a time limit, Leanne's going to be doing the presentation, but I'm doing the intro. And so Leanne and I would like to say hi, first of all. And um, Finding New Favorites is an on tail retail store that specializes in um, showcasing and selling products geared towards the graphic design or um, professionals there like. It is a drop shipping company. So we feel like we're on the cusp because like with COVID-19, um, everybody's ordering offline. So um, I'm gonna let Leanne do the presentation. And then if you guys have any questions, you know, we're more than happy to answer them at the end. Okay, here's Leanne. All right, next slide, please. Okay, welcome. And again, thank you for your time today. And uh, next slide. Okay, so the goal of Find Your New Favorite um, for us is going to be connecting new devices and gadgets, tech, hardware, um, with students and professionals who need it most. And we really want to specialize on unique things, not just your average pens and pencils, but like the latest cutting edge, fun, trending items out there. Um, next slide, please. So before we get started, our team consists of myself, Leanne, and Michael. Uh, we're going to have all our bases covered uh, with our with our shared efforts, uh, but with when it comes down to it, Mike's gonna kind of um, be more the sales, website, branding, marketing guy. And I'm gonna focus a little bit more on finding those products and marketing research so that we're supplying exactly what our clientele wants and needs. Next slide. So the product is our website itself, Find Your New Favorite. And how it works is we'll have um, items up there we believe that design students are gonna want and need to make their projects go faster and more efficient. And it's actually a website you can buy the items from and we do an order fulfillment and actually how it works is the products go right from the manufacturer to the customer. So we don't have any inventory that we have to keep on hand, which is great because we won't be having to like try to push products that we have on hand. We're free to always implement new products as they come in. Again, really keeping up with trends and new funky um, items to use. Next slide. What's going to make us different and stand apart from your big box stores like Amazon is that we really want to educate and demonstrate how the products work. So before people buy, we actually want our website to first be an educational tool. Again, when you buy online, you just see a couple little pictures. You hope it's going to work how it says it works. Um, but we're going to buy the products, test them, try them, have video content so people can kind of try it before you buy it through us, in a sense, through our video content. So that's really where we want to push is um, that we have it available to see and use and interact with us with the option to purchase as well, if you'd like. Next slide. Okay, our revenue model. Um, our goal is to sell our items for cost plus 200%. 100% going toward business overhead expenses, like keeping the website running. And the additional 100% will be flexible because um, we want to be, say, have competitive prices with the big box stores. Um, but if, if we did get the extra one, it'd go toward more product research, buying new products, trying them. We might not sell everything we try out, of course. We want the best of the best. Uh, next slide, please. 
Okay, so our competition, we have listed here Amazon, Walmart, and eBay. And not that these are direct competitors with us, but we feel that's what people kind of default go to. It's easy to just kind of search something, pick the, you know, one of the first 10 or 20 you see. Um, and that's where we want to really go through, comb through these products, present the ones that we've used and work like we, they should work. Next slide. So to get our name out there, we're going to start with the first four P's in marketing, the marketing mix, with uh, product in place being the website itself, and then we're going to be advertising to get our website name out there. Um, also price, we're going to definitely check up with our price compared to other ones to stay really competitive. So we're, we don't want to gouge our customers at all. We just want to um, spread what we found, what we think is going to work for us, what's going to work with our student or fellow students as well. And lastly, promotion. So we really plan on spending the summer on doing product research. And then for this fall coming up, we plan on running student promotions and maybe even bundling some products together. Next slide. And then further marketing penetration will be through um, ads. We're gonna do lots of social media. We wanna be on Pinterest, Facebook, Snapchat, all the normal stuff. And then we're also wanna utilize clubs and organizations that we belong with through college. Um, so that we can kind of get in our foot in the door, maybe in some professional aspects as well. Next slide. So this is just kind of a, a through the summer and into the fall projection. We're, we don't plan on making, so we're not really revenue driven for the summer. We want to invest in buying products, trying them out, getting video content going, and then be geared up for this fall to run promotions and get some um, great gadgets in some students' hands. Next slide. Two minutes left. Okay, so this kind of brings us to the end. So this is the sign you've been waiting for, or hopefully the website we've been waiting for. Um, we're gearing toward finding people who, instead of taking all the time themselves to research all these products, we're gonna do that. We're gonna show some fun videos of how the products work and display it for them. And really what we're gonna do is tap, we want to tap into um, the millennials. So we want to cater how they buy, because we know that they have, they're gonna have about $1.4 trillion of purchasing power as they, um, grow up even more and stuff. So, oh, yep, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> the one last thing is um, we definitely just want to hit some of our initial milestones before we do a full launch of anything else. So we need to rebrand our website. We have the website. We just kind of have to fine tune it. Um, and we're going to get started and hopefully open an LLC, get a company bank account, and kind of get that all in place over the next few months. With that, thank you so much. And Mike and I will be happy to um, answer any questions or receive any feedback. Oh, next slide. Oh, yep. Thanks for coming today. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, I have one question. I have a question. Yeah. Um, have you thought about any additional revenue um, models? Because as your costs go up for running the business, can you have you considered? Can you maintain the um, cost plus plus two hundred percent on your product as your costs go up. So let's say you have to hire another ten people, and now you have more costs when it comes to paying people. Can you continue to sell the product at two hundred percent at that rate when you have ten more people on your payroll? Mm. Well, when that comes up, I think that um, because we're on a learning curve and we're um, we'll be adjusting that as we go along. So to project that out is kind of difficult because the trends and um, the trends and everything that's going on in the world right now and online shopping, everything is changing so dramatically and so fast that it's really, you almost have to like change up your business plan every other month or whatever. Right. And then we'll project out that way for, to see where we are. Right. But I mean, as of right now, because we're, um, it's drop shipping. I mean, her and I pretty much can do everything because I can take care of all the marketing and the web and everything like that. So we don't have to outsource that. And then the marketing research and all that she can do. So we kind of have like everything covered in that sense. And then when we do um, back to your question, when we do get to that point, then we will definitely have to like sit down and then recalibrate, you know, our funding and our finances and stuff like that. Right. Um, the reason I bring that up is because a lot of the businesses, so COVID hits, and a lot of the businesses are having to, you know, up their tech costs, for example. Um, 
there are a lot of increases in their costs that they didn't expect, not even really, you know, employees or anything like that. There's just an increase in costs that were just not expected. So, um, so thinking about those kinds of things, my concern is, can you, can you maintain with that one revenue model of simply charging the extra 200% um, if something were to happen with your business where you have to increase your costs somewhere? That's, that's something I want you to, to think about. So thinking about additional revenue models like, you know, um, working with your vendors on, you know, perhaps uh, running advertising on your website, you know, using advertising as something that you can generate additional revenue on, um, those kinds of things, finding other ways to maybe turning your YouTube channel into an additional revenue stream, things like that, because not relying on one revenue model to you know run your business um so thinking about those types of things out the gate so in case you have to scale much faster than you thought you were going to have to scale um those kinds of things because you don't want to be surprised you know because uh, i've seen a lot of my clients are surprised that they grew much faster than they thought they were going to grow and now they have additional costs they didn't expect right thank you yeah thanks a lot to consider <laughs> i think this is a really interesting concept i i have to say i love that like i actually go to those sites that actually give me demos of the cool latest products because i i consider myself a gadget geek um so with that how will you guys differentiate compared to others that are doing this in the market um because there are are other youtube channels that are just fun and they're gaining momentum, but what, are, what will be the hook that brings you guys the differentiation? Well, we really want to concentrate on um, loyalty. So if they are incentivized to maybe, you know, subscribe or be, become part of that, we kind of hope it's kind of an interactive back and forth where they can leave comments, suggestions, reviews of their own, and kind of just become like, you know, we're in this together. We're, we're coworkers in that sense and helping each other find the right things. And on the website itself, it'll actually have like the educational tab so they don't have to back out and look up what the product actually does. We're actually going to have the education right there on that website. So it'll be the item and then they can click, you know, information. Kind of like, um, you know, all those cords, all the USB cords that were um, <laughs> on one of the slides. Well, we actually, what well, we actually looked it up because like, so a lot of people don't know the multiple uses for all those chords. Like if you need a mini, a C, a D, a B, or which one will actually transfer data back and forth. Well, we did the research on that and then we'd explain it, you know, in the educational part. So to make sure that they pick out the right USB cord for their device or, you know, Apple, Android, you know, or even streaming to your TV or from your computer to your TV monitor or, mm -hmm things like that so and I think because we're not making our own product we're not saying this is the one solution all you know right. we have thousands of products to choose from to pick so we're not gonna be like brand specific it's just like does this item function is it gonna work and what's the latest trends and get those in front of customers Great. thank you judges we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next thank you thank you Okay. Thanks, Mike, Leanne. Next up, we have Rosalie Belde. Here we go. When does my timer begin? Whenever you start, go ahead. Okay. So, both greenhouse food grown under lights underground. Uh, so I have a controlled environmental agriculture or indoor farming is about growing plants indoors on a single or multi-level infrastructure. Some indoor farms use robots, some do not. Volt Greenhouse wants to use robots and is focused on plant species not yet used in other indoor farms. Um, pesticide free, indoor farms can grow 10 times or more food, use much less water and have low crop loss compared to field growing since they are protected year-round from harsh weather and healthy. 
quickly. There you go. Oh, so cute. We just can see him. Okay. Fruit. Um, with that, it's up to the indoor farm to incorporate pollinate, pollinators into their management program. But if not, quick guess. Fruit can be grown indoors. Uh, my fig trees that you see are being doused in a spectrum of light that put plants in a photosynthetic happy place. So there's also a reason for concentrating on plants that grow indoors. Um, besides eggplant, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, and pear, um, there's other varieties that would tap into the market that is not in the area. So you're able to beat other growers for locally grown produce. Okay, Nick. Yeah. Okay, this is so exciting. Uh, in the middle, his name is Brandon Alexander. And he is the CEO of Iron Ox. And remember when I said some people are robot companies, some people not? Okay, he did 100% automated robotic company. Pack of seating all the way to packaging, it's awesome. And Brandon says this, he says, I think the more players and the more people tackling this problem, the better. This is a massive market that is still stuck with the highly centralized process of field farming. Thanks for Since there are many robotic companies and indoor farms, but few of them are 100% robotic. And as a pre-startup, planning the blending of necessary technology with cost-minded innovation looks challenging. But seeing companies like Iron Ox is inspiring. And on that note, Madison College acquired a farm bot, which by the way is also the name of the company. It's on a fixed pneumatic rail system with programmable options. Um, with that, the technology is out there. It's it's, it's all, it takes for a person to tap into it. Take the next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, I'm reading this one. Pick and save grocery got rid of hundreds of pounds of food inventory. At one of their locations, they have a box at the entrance for food donations from the public. This is an example of food distribution gone wrong. We have enough food. Why are the people not getting the food? The point of indoor farming is to prevent this from happening. This can be solved by growing food near or in urban areas, staying in contact with food banks and nonprofits like Safe Haven, establishing customer orders well in advance so that that quantity of food can be grown, and also enable vouchers and other assistance usable at Bolt Greenhouse. Field growing, don't get me started. It's about putting energy into 60 bushels of apples. So that in the end you can have 48 bushels of apples. If you can solve even this problem, you fix a lot of other problems. Yeah. Okay. I won't read this. I'll just move on to what I have written down. One of the keys for either path is learning from others. Dr. Despomier, the father of vertical farming. You gotta read his book. He made it layman friendly, so you guys can read it. Amanda Feats of Kenny Strawberry Farm, Jim Pantaleo consulted for indoor farming, Mike Zilkin and Tisha Livingston of 80 Acres Farms, who said in an article, they will share what they know about lighting sensors, vision systems, robots, and automation. Daniel Malachuk, CEO of Calera said, today, more than ever, consumers are focused on understanding where their product comes from, how far it's traveled to get to them, how many times it has been handled, and how safe and clean it is. There you go. Here we go. Um, so many companies have overcome obstacles. You can see right there the rain, rain cloud of doom. Um, but indoor farming allows for, okay, many markets to be tapped into. At first I'm like, oh, you know, I'll just go with the gardeners. Like, oh, I'll just go with the people at the farmer's market. No, we gotta make it accessible to as many variety as possible. So if there's changes in one market, we have another one to tap into, hence restaurant industry. If that goes by 90% is your, you know, sales, whoops. So variety would be essential. Um, next one. Two minutes left. Awesome, I'm doing great. Okay. Indoor Vertical Farm Second Chance in Delaware was founded by Ajit George. Those who left prison, he helps gain skills and employment through his company, also reducing recidivism. 
if you look down, you'll see a GT standing to the right, right next to the sign. He's wearing an actual, he's the only one, one of two people with a full suit. Okay, he's awesome. Um, then up in the far corner, you guys see a man wearing a hat, beard. He is the CEO of Gravity, Gravity Process Card Processing Transaction. In 2015, he decided he's going to give all of his employees a raise up to $70,000. His investors told him, wow, that's really dumb. Other people said, your business is going to fail and your workload from your employees is going to be lax. Well, some years later and $7 billion later, he's fully proven them wrong. Both of these companies and other companies, when they are employee minded, have uh, succeeded in supporting their employees. There's a lot of revenues dependent upon having low wage workers. You can't do that because in the long term, you screw up your company anyways. You have to put, you can't, you, you invest in your infrastructure, you also have to invest in your employees. So, okay, you can click on the next one. Okay. So this is the end. This is uh, whatever you've taken or bitten out of the talk. Uh, as far as numbers, there's different types of structures that can be built and different designs. All of them have different startup costs and operating costs, depending upon what they are. First the design, then the estimation. I can say that the top two eaters of revenue is energy and labor costs. If those two are managed well, then the rest of the business will fall into place, aside from research. It's fascinating. Okay, I'm done. Rosalie, this is Jill here. Um, love the concept. I love local food sources and all that. Um, I live in a very agricultural area, so I'm um, really kind of in tune with this. Where would you locate this sort of thing? Would it be in Wisconsin? Yes. Um, okay, so in talks, in talking about the energy and labor, you said are the two uh, most, probably the largest expenses that you're going to incur. Um, what does that, I would think locating in Wisconsin might be a challenge during those winter months in terms of those energy costs. Um, how, you know, like what type of price points in terms of expenses are you looking at? Because I think that would be just a huge expense. Or would you take some time off from growing during that time, during the winter months? What would that really look like, I guess? And would you, also would you incorporate any hydroponic type concepts into your greenhouse? Oh my gosh, you just asked so many wonderful things. Okay, so there's like this huge science behind everything you just asked. And I do not know how to condense it down to the, like the tiny the answer possible. Well, I'm gonna try. Okay, first, if I had my way, I would go underground. Underground would mean that I'd have a constant temperature between 50 and 53 degrees. Most plants that are edible can tolerate that or thrive in it. That also reduces heating costs. Also, by carefully portioning out the lighting and the heating use for a structure, you're able to help manage that cost for that, along with using alternative forms of energy. There's also, as there always has been, it's always been out there, um, other experimental concept design, prototyping, researchers out there doing other forms of energy through finding electricity, through growing algae, to anything from, oh, solid state batteries. Let me tell you, the solid state batteries are getting up there. That means that you get so much storage so that in a three day period, if you don't have electricity or the power lines are down or the solar panels are bashed by tornado, you can say, okay, I have this much storage. With that, it's also about calculating the inputs that all the plants need. Do you want to put in like crazy amount of light, like crazy energy, or do you want to like find plants that can tolerate lower amounts of energy? You can balance the high energy plants with the low energy plants. And in the end, <laughs> in the end, you'll have, it's, you'll have that balanced out. Price point also is with, if you had 75 different plants that you're growing, each one of them has a different market price. Okay, I know I'm saying the F word now, figs. Figs have different 
Figs can be, the Chicago pricing for figs retail is $6 a pound. Um, for right now, in my pick and save grocery store, $2.29 for one organic avocado. It has to do, and of course it has to do with food distribution, but with those different price points, you have to find an overall average with all of them. Um, so I can say that, for example, let's do an easy one, radishes. Radishes, you get them, you produce them, 22 days. From germination to there, you get a radish. One pound of radishes, you can get out of that, what's left over, you're gonna get 25 cents. So 25 cents a pound times 1,000 pounds, there you have that. Um, so if I answer that question or just threw a bunch of words at you, Thank you. Boy. So um, it sounds like in order to put, you know, um, your finan financials together, you would have to know exactly what you're going to be growing almost to be able to put your financials together, your cost and every, you know, projection, all that. You have mm -hmm. to actually know what you want to grow, what your farms, what you it's actually going to look like to be able to put all that together. Okay. Wait. Okay. Yeah, that's what it sounds like to me. In order for you to know what your what your costs are going to be. That's right, because different plants require different inputs. Some plants are happy with less water. Some plants are happy with more. Same thing with lighting, fertilizer. So it's like you say, oh, you know, I'm going to have this much input and then that's it for one thing, you can't. So you have to really understand what, I'm gonna talk about plants in terms of people, but what everyone needs and then figure out an average. Um, many indoor farms have spent years um, experimenting, failures, successes, you know, experimentation, and they've learned what works and what does not work. Um, now that information is available. Since 2010, before 2010, there wasn't really any indoor farm per se. Just a bunch of researchers monkeying around with lights. Um, after that, people just went and said, let's do this. Um, Aero Farms, they started just after 2010, after Dr. Despomir put on this book, Inspiring People. It's just, they have so much experience. Um, by tapping into that, and then adding even the most recent innovations as of like the beginning of this year. Amazing things can be done. It's not an exaggeration, it's actually pretty amazing. It's mind blowing. Okay, Thanks. so Rosalie. Oh, anybody, oh, Don, you had a, who had a, I'll, I'll shut up. I have more questions, but. <laughs> <laughs> I love questions. No worries. We're just gonna keep uh, things going with time here. So we're gonna move on to the next. If we have more questions, we can go and connect you to the judges later on after too. Okay. All right, Kelsey, keeping us on track. <clears throat> That's a good thing. Okay, next up we have uh, Sadiq Wanyaka. So, hi, <clears throat> let me first pull up things over here. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sadiq, and uh, I am a high school student um, attending MATC through the STEM Academy program. And today, I'm going to be introducing the error question and answer system. Next, um, an error question and answer system is a, uh, is, a, is a system that simplifies the process of, of solving um, programming errors or solving programming errors. And why would anyone need uh, this kind of system? It all, it all narrows down to time and simplicity. Um, as a young programmer, I have noticed that programmers go through a long process to build software. And one of the steps in the process that takes up the most time is solving errors. And uh, uh, next, please. Uh, so the, the, the big problem here is there's too much to read. Programmers research, do a lot of research. Um, they read a lot of articles, blogs, and uh, watch YouTube videos just to get an idea or 
even find a solution on how to solve a specific error. So next, um, but the uh, solution to this is uh, using a technique called extra, uh, extraction, uh, text extraction, um, to extract relevant information from uh, large documentations. So if you had like a hundred documentations, you can build a question and answer system that can extract relevant information from all this from all this large text and give it to you so that you can instead of you reading all through all this documentation you can just have this simplified text for you for yourself to to understand what's going on next please so my program works in this kind of process it has three layers uh, it has an input an ai processing layer and then an output layer in an input layer it has this is where the programmer puts in questions or an error statement and then the next la layer this is the ai artificial intelligence processing this is where the program uh, gets documentations uh, from a database or, or on the web and gets it gets relevant documentations and then it extracts it ex extracts relevant text from those documentations and then the last layer, this is where it outputs the information to the program. Next. So we at, uh, I, am I am targeting programmers, pro pro professionals and enthusiasts, um, software development, uh, development companies. And next. And uh, one of my competitors is uh, Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is a very big site. I also use it as a programmer. And uh, um, it has helped so many programmers out there. It's it's a site that uh, it's a site that hosts questions, all kinds of questions and answers about programming. So, but but there's a there's a downside that uh, uh, um, it, it's it takes time. So, for example, if I went to Stack Overflow and posted a question about a, a specific error, it may take time for someone to reply to me, or um, uh, the, the public may reject my question that oh the question isn't clear or anything of that kind. But with my program, I can, I can, uh, you can give me the, you can give it a question, a question or a, an error statement, and then the program will extract some keywords in your questions and, uh, error, uh, and the error statement to give you some relevant information from, from your question or error statement. Next question, uh, next slide, sorry. And uh, my revenue model is uh, SaaS, uh, SaaS software as a service. Um, I'm going to be, uh, uh, sorry, pro, uh, my customers will be uh, buying, uh, paying for subscriptions, monthly or yearly subscriptions. Up next. And the goal here is to simplify how, how programmers uh, find solutions to errors. If programmers, if programmers uh, use an error uh, question and answer system to solve um, errors and bugs, they will reduce the time they spend researching about an error because error an error statement, an error question and answer system simplifies the process of, uh, of, of, of selecting relevant information from large documentations um, so that the programmer doesn't spend all this time reading through all this uh, documentation. Next slide, please. So this is a, a prototype that I was working on. It's not perfect, it's still under development. And uh, this, is, I was using Watson Discovery and Watson is, Watson is an is an AI built by IBM, and uh, in the green box in the green box over here, this is where you can type in a question or an error statement. Uh, right now, there's an error statement, and then you can get a, an, a result uh, that uh, a result as a, a simplified um, like extracted information from from other documentations. Two minutes left. Um, next, please. So on the team, I'm the only one on the team, Sadiq, um, Sadiq Wanyaka, and uh, I, I am I am from uh, Africa, Uganda. Um, uh, I'm still I'm st I still have a lot to learn in programming, but I'm I am I'm experienced enough to build whatever I want. <laughs> uh, next slide. Um, and that's the end. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Sadiq. And I will tell you, um, I know my programmers <laughs> suffer with trying to find the answers they need and Slack is definitely helpful. Um, how will you help the market
find your site? You know, like, what are you thinking about from a marketing perspective? Because there is a need for this, but there's so much on the web. How do they find you? So th that's, that's going to be a very big challenge for me, but um, I, have so many uh, I have so many friends out there that can help me uh, advertise this thing out there. I have, uh, um, so one of my mentors um, owns um, a hacker space. Uh, it's called Sector, Sector 67, and I have so many programmers there. I have so many friends that do programming out there. They're, they're supporting me to build this thing. And um, hopefully I can go through them to advertise this uh, project. I thought this was a super interesting concept. Um, the one thing that I was a little unclear about, and this just may be that you haven't gotten that far in the process, is the cost and then understanding what people would be willing to pay for the service. So for, for this, uh, um, so the, there is there is not much uh, for what. So so like it's it's, it's a basic like service. So it's just one service. Like uh, the customer is only going to be using it to find um, answers or errors. Oh, sorry sorry, um, solutions to errors or ideas. Um, so what they will be paying for is. Uh, just to get the access like it's like paying for a search engine so about the cost i'm not i haven't really looked through the cost yet but um probably i have to like sit down and see how i'm going to charge and all that but i haven't gone through that um yeah sadiq have you looked at um Protecting, I mean, this is your intellectual property that you're you're building, if I understand it right. Yes. The service, so um, have you looked into protecting that uh, before before you kind of go a little more public with it? Yeah, um, I haven't really uh, looked into protecting the idea yet, but I, I feel like the idea is already out there. Like people are trying to build question and answer systems using AI systems. And uh, they're trying to find AI. They're trying to build um, um, text extraction algorithms. So eventually, they they will have this. They will have this idea of like building and uh, building a system that will extract information or answers from 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 documents. So it's it's an idea that's already out there. That I'm not really worried that someone will steal it or anything. Um, yeah, yeah. Sadiq, this is Jill here. I just want to give you a shout out for being a high school student and, and being innovative and curious and creative. And that goes for everyone here. But I think as a high school student, that's really cool to see. Thanks. 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 <clears throat> OK, anything else? Great. Good job, Sadiq. Thank you. Okay. Okay, next up, uh, we have Bradley Burt. Brad? Apologize, I was unmuted, or I was unmuted. Well, welcome everyone to Outpost 422. I'm your host, Bradley Jason Burt. I want to thank all of you for coming today and for taking time out of your uh, busy schedules to be here. Outpost 422 was the project I created in Launch Your Business, which then became my talk show for the Madison College Clarion broadcast as the general manager. So what I've done is I've taken on the responsibility to create like a campus overwatch. And now University of Wisconsin Whitewater is my client. Outpost 422 is a blogcast service. I am a freelance blogger, thanks to the journalism certificate program. That all started with the Madison College Challenge. Next slide, please. So my blogcast story that I give on air every week that is also now on the Madison College SoundCloud is my Veterans Crisis Line Survivor, my Appeal Survival, and my Madison College Challenge three-year journey. 
the Madison College Challenge in 2018 opened a portal for me to start to learn how to do prototype writing, which has now led into me writing a narrative. So now what I do is I create narratives and I deliver that service to corporations through their employee assistance program to help employees on the floor who could be struggling with making that decision to go to the VA or call, call the crisis line. So in this picture, uh, in this moment, I served in Haiti during Operation Uphold Democracy. I was a member of the Port-au-Prince uh, and Cap Haitian Quick Reactionary Force on search and destroy missions. In this specific story, the one that I share with my narrative, it is uh, when Bertrand Aristide was returned to power. I was uh, protecting two interpreters and a special forces commander that day. And so what I do is I take this narrative into my position with the uh, Wisconsin Department of American Legion Suicide Awareness Committee. And so what I'm doing is I'm using the Madison College VA Vital Program to develop this narrative. So next, next slide, please. So here's the problem. Um, I am a post 9-11, I am not a post 9-11 veteran. Veterans from my era in the 90s, we just walked off our injuries and we didn't go into the VA to get help because we thought, you know, we're, we're not as bad as those that were in Vietnam. And so what that did was it created like a long-term untreated, undiagnosed, un, um, you know, unabated issue within us that created a static condition. And then I later found out that Madison College is the only uh, campus that offers this vital service. So I got to work and we created this program through uh, the Interpersonal Communication Department at UW-Whitewater through the chair, uh, Dr. Kathy Brady, who is allowing me to pursue the business plan certificate next year to develop these hyperlinks to survey those who are trauma-informed. We're taking on overcoming the impossibility of COVID-19 trauma. So some of the problems I faced in the beginning that the Madison College Challenge helped me do with the Kaufman template were like classroom disruptions, sleepless nights, waiting for grades, loss of memory with test taking and migraine headaches. With prototype writing, I was able to write out during anxiety attacks to calm myself down. And so that led me into the 2019 Madison College Challenge, which then led into the Launcher Business Program which is now the product today. Next slide, please. So the solution is, my, my minimal viable solution is to offer a blog narrative to help others who struggle in, in times of panic attacks, like I do, find their way through their panic attack to learn how to overcome you know, dropping out of school. We have a current, we had a current rate of 20% success rate from transferring from Madison College to UW-Whitewater, according to a couple of the uh, unnamed officials I'm not allowed to speak or share about, who are in the veteran department that just off the cuff shared with me that a lot of the Madison College uh, transfers that are, are coming over from the vital program can't, aren't making the cut. So helping an individual write that narrative and develop their own narrative helps them overcome the impossibility of dropping out of school. That's really what this is all about. So corporate EAP was where I found that I had this issue. The VA kept denying my claims. They kept denying me the ability to go back to school. They kept saying that I had this um, anxiety issue and that it wasn't really, that there weren't enough for them to, for me to seek treatment. And it wasn't until that I actually took it seriously and went to the corporate EAP that they went back to the VA and said, you have to treat this individual. You have to let him into this program. He needs help. So my whole goal here for the solution is to allow corporate EAP a privatized model through the Mission Act. And that's what I'm doing right now at UW-Whitewater. We are taking a, um, a basic graduate degree, somebody who's pursuing a graduate degree to use an individual who's trauma-informed for a dissertation and to take them through that journey with the broadcast to investigate and find out the nature of what's causing them to have problems in school. And what ends up happening at the very end of this two minutes is that- left. Two minutes left? So what happens at the end of this is that they come out on the other side like I did this semester. I'm a consortium 4.0. I've got a 4.0 at two schools. I'm also a member of the National Society of Leadership and Success. And so this project was part of my, my campaign project. Next slide, please. So the revenue model, basically what I do right now in Launch Your Business, they told us to experiment, experiment, experiment. I created an experiment at Madison College. I adopted uh, six Bravo Troop 6-6 six, six CAV 
from Ford Operating Base Fenty. They tune into the Madison College Clearing Server to calm down. I raise money for them. What I have is, is basically like a flow chart of what would cost you to adopt a, a platoon over in Afghanistan. What I've done with that is I've allowed them to use my website for free. And so the narratives are currently uh, serving them overseas. I, I raise usually around $150 a month. But what I'm looking to do to surpass this is to uh, take on some of the corporate grants. The White House has a grant. And what I've created is like a flow of digital currency to fund these missions. Next slide, please. So what is blogcasting? Blogcasting takes you through a journey. And when you're having a panic attack, instead of reading a thousand word blog, you read like 200 words, then you go to a podcast, then you go to a video, because with the journalism certificate program, I'm finishing up documentary storytelling and I'm getting ready to tell the narrative through documentary of my journey through the Madison College Challenge. Now, what I've also done too is um, I've allowed my sponsors to advertise on my website who are willing to uh, help me back this mission. Next slide, please. So this was created this semester and where I am right now, I'm actually running the Madison College broadcast through this. This was created for a backup plan for COVID-19 UW Whitewater picked it up and said that it's helped students survive. It's helped them get through this crisis through some of the tools and methods that I used in combat relayed back to them so that they can overcome their anxiety attacks and use the download the PTSD coach app. I help people get through the PTSD coach app to conquer those uh, circumstances. Next slide, please. You've hit so this ad minutes, Brad, just so you know. Okay, so this, this was taken out by the uh, general manager of broadcast team. We took out an ad in UW Whitewater's Royal Purple. In the lower corner, you see the QR voucher code. That QR voucher takes you on the broadcast journey. This is what I'm offering corporations to do at UW Whitewater through the Royal Purple to take employees through a journey and help them get, get into EAP, even though they, they don't want to try and use the service, just to try to use it through my narratives and see how it'll help them out. Next, uh, next slide, please. So the mission statement, overcome impossibility. Uh, that campaign ad was for the National Society of Leadership Success. That was my project. Um, Overcoming Possibility was two words I got from a Thought Club project. The 10th Mountain Division, they say climb to glory. Well, I came up with another one, Overcoming Possibility, because that's what it's really like being in the classroom as a student who has a blast wave trauma injury, who I recently just found out was my, my number one problem. Thanks to corporate EAP helping me out. Next slide, please. So as a general manager of broadcast, I've learned how to manage a lot of funds, resources, and accounts, um, students, the whole nine yards. So we're creating a UW transfer program. It's called the Royal Purple Hearts. We want to take you from the VA crisis line through Madison College into UW Whitewater and right for the Royal Purple. Next slide, please. So again, I want to thank every one of you for uh, having me here today. And I just want to let everyone know that Outpost 422 is going to continue to move forward with uh, the American Legion Post 501 of Madison, Wisconsin that I'm an adjutant for. This service originally started out for the Suicide Awareness Committee. Uh, they've picked up the new service. It's called Engage 22. So I'm taking this over to the corporations. I actually spoke with uh, Colton, or Greg Colton at, at the Baird Patriot Program. He loves the idea. He wants to see me develop it further. Once I get this thing developed and off the ground with corporate philanthropy, we will have an effective crisis intervention system in the University of Wisconsin. Thank you for your time. Well, Bradley, thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for the great thank presentation. Um, this was amazing. One of the things I, I see is an opportunity for you to syndicate this, right? Be able to make this available to um, others outside of Wisconsin, outside of our school system. Have you thought about kind of going beyond just the state of Wisconsin and what that can I have, a I have a global reach right now. I've reached over 70,000 people with one blog. Um, I learned the persuasive techniques and argumentation and debate and also in uh, advertising at Whitewater. And really what I'm doing is I'm, I'm targeting an individual at the 11th hour of crisis. And so I'm using my narrative. My narrative, the branding is called the Jaded Patriot. And that's just for everybody. I'm trying to break down the walls of stigma with, you know, veterans receiving mental health versus other people who suffered other forms of trauma. I want all who have experienced trauma, especially in COVID-19, 
to have the same services I receive at the VA. And that's why I'm pushing hard for corporate EAP and the Mission Act so that we can get the data out there so that everyone who's trauma-informed can receive these services. You might even consider partnering with some other organizations that too are also trying to serve that same, that same, I shouldn't say that same audience, all of us being impacted by this, but those that have um, seen a significant amount. And I think you're already starting to do that with um, some of the organizations you have, but you might look at others too. And the gift is writing the therapy in these blogs is how I stay regulated. It keeps my disability. It, it has helped me improve my grades to the point now where uh, UW-Whitewater gave me the non-traditional excellence award for the semester. So I won that award this semester and it all started with the Madison College Challenge. I strongly encourage all the contestants to keep moving forward with your businesses. Stay strong in yourself, confide in yourself and find solitude in the fact that you have a brilliant idea and grow it. Brad, just a quick comment. Yeah, it's been nice to see your progress over the past three years that you've been with us and working on Thank you. various ideas. Uh, it's been fun to see you grow and really refine this a little bit. Congrats on that. Thank you so much. Okay, any other questions for Brad? Can, can anyone ask a question? Do we have time, Kelsey, or do we keep moving? Uh, let's just keep it moving. All right. Afterwards, certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Okay. Okay. Thanks again, Brad. Uh, next up, we have Marley Tau. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today, Amy, um, and listening to my my business plan. Um, I am MLT Consulting, um, Motivational Leadership Transformative Coaching, um, uh, based in Madison, Wisconsin. Next. Um, organizational and personal development are both healthy cycles in everyone's life. Um, most recently, um, with COVID-19, a lot of organizations are seeing that they are quickly needing to reinvent and adjust to the workforce. Um, <clears throat> uh, so we know that at the heart of every successful community and organization um, is development. And so my consulting services are geared to coaching um, at three tiers, the organizational level um, that encompasses teams, of um, the workforce, the frontline, or the leadership team, um, executive coaching and consulting. So those would be the leadership team um, on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis, and then individual coaching um, for a lifestyle. So that is outside of the organizational realm um, and more on a one-on-one -on -one personal development um, uh, area. Let's see. Uh, so our... Um, Prior to COVID-19, organizations were, or the workforce was actually seeing um, a record uh, low in unemployment, which made it hard to um, recruit. And so retaining your top talent is one of the most vital things an organization can do uh, for uh, their business. Um, and so with MLT Consulting, our job is to provide those services for organizations to work from the top down to ensure that their employees are satisfied, productive, and um, in staying with the company. Next. So here you'll see our three tiers. We've got the organizational consulting, executive consult co coaching, and individual coaching. Um, under organizational consulting, we would work on strategy planning, improved efficiency, retaining the employees, uh, developing total reward programs, um, and um, supporting leadership and the employees through um, reorganization. Uh, internal communications also goes hand in hand with that. With executive coaching, um, the one-on-one -on -one, uh, service provides action-oriented measures uh, identifying where the executive is at in their leadership development, what kind of leadership style do they have, and what type of uh, style do they desire to integrate into their um, leadership, 
uh, and developing that executive presence, uh, like I mentioned, because we all know that uh, influence of the organization comes from the top down. Uh, so if your executives are not um, top notch, uh, it, it trickle, the trickle down effect really affects your productivity, ultimately affecting your business revenue. On an individual basis, uh, we work on thoughtful coaching, um, developing next steps and identifying goals and breaking that down into uh, the different uh, transitional periods uh, that the in individual can um, anticipate. Uh, and this also falls, in, falls into job search. Um, so providing uh, employ employment services for individuals and identifying career a career path. Next. So here we just see um, a representation of those different tiers. Next. And this is all, um, again, uh, this is identifying uh, our competitors. So organizational development consultants are going to be a direct competitor on the corporate training side, uh, staffing agencies, executive coaches, and internal human resource offices. Um, on an individual uh, side of competition, we have virtual coaches. Uh, lifestyle coaches are um, all over the internet if you um, ever Google that, uh, career counselors and job boards um, will take away service or compete with me. Next. Here is a projection of revenue and income. Um, so, at, at, uh, so for finances, um, to start up, there is a fairly low overhead. Uh, so personal savings and family investments uh, would help me get my business started. I have a snapshot of direct service sales, um, the pl uh, plan that I would put together and anticipate um, applying in my business. So with organizational consulting, um, I would provide a minimum of 15 hours a week, which is a guaranteed um, $100 an hour. Um, so these Next are slide. all um, uh, minimum uh, hours. Um, and then you'll see the customer pay plan. Uh, which would be uh, in monthly billing. Next. Here's a revenue projection for a 12 month um, with those minimum uh, commitments from the organizations. Um, we project a total uh, revenue of $133,000 um, in 12 months. Next. And the marketing campaigns and uh, business partnership and models that I would um, incorporate in this um, are the following. Next. Developing a local presence. So utilizing the resources I have um, in um, and contacts that I have. So reaching out to local businesses and developing those relationships, working with my competitors like staffing agencies who don't provide their um, clients with uh, um, interview or job prep coaching. Um, in that position, I would generate revenue for them um, when their individuals uh, are received a uh, contract with other employers. Uh, attend networking events and increasing my visibility within the community um, to, to develop my brand um, so that it's not just a service but also a uh, brand. Next. Uh, number two is to establish an online presence. So developing those blogs, um, developing a, a blog channel on YouTube uh, so that I can explore virtual coaching um, and expand my clientele uh, um, outside of just local customers. Next. Um, and then resources would be colleagues, um, uh, networks that I, I have already and then developing those additional networks with local places like Madison College, um, local banks and places like Woodbeck. Next. You've hit your seven minutes just so you know. Okay. okay. Um, um, so this is just a summary of me. I would be happy to connect with any of the judges or anyone else who is listening um, to share more about myself. I am a graduate at Edgewood College of Organizational Behavior Leadership. Um, individual and organizational development are extremely important to communities um, and growth. Um, and so I would like to be a part of 
um, continuing um, the economic and societal growth. Next. Thank you for your time. I had a quick question from the standpoint of, you know, you talked a little bit about your competition, but I guess understanding how you would differentiate yourself from your competition. Sure. Um, I, I would be more of a boutique um, service. Uh, if, I, if I were to compare myself to um, like a uh, staffing agency where they are constantly looking to staff at high numbers, um, my services would be uh, more so for clients who are looking for the style that I provide, the lifestyle that, or the lifestyle um, that I'm marketing um, and uh, sell my uniqueness in that way. That's great. Thank you. Um, I had the same question, Julie, um, but one of the things I was, you were kind of commenting on um, that there's there we, but identified, I think right now it's just you. Are you looking to hire more coaches to, you know, come alongside with you in your organization? Is that something now or in the future? And then also, have you looked into some of the free resources to get your, your name out there, like, you know, doing sessions at the Dream Bank or even working with like others, like in the Doyen group or others? So just some things to think about there. Yeah, um, right now it is just me and that would be probably the, the five-year plan. Um, down the road, I'd like to grow maybe to four or five employees max, but I like to keep that small boutique feel. Um, have you have you thought about <clears throat> targeting any specific groups of people? I have. Um, so years ago, I started an Instagram group, which was um, kind of what influenced my um, current uh, marketing brand and style. Um, for individual coaching, I would like to first explore uh, women uh, who are uh, seeking a career change or starting a business and um, targeting that through my YouTube videos with lifestyle vlogs um, and influencing them um, that way. Um, with organizations, I'm open to um, um, smaller to uh, medium-sized local businesses first. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Was there, was there other, any other question? No questions. I was just going to say, I think it's smart to target um, staffing agencies and places like that, just because right now in this change of the economy, there's going to, there's a lot of businesses changing and um, evolving or folding up. And so um, sometimes that coaching thing can be seen as ancillary, but I think definitely if you're out looking, they need somebody like you to bring them the, the right skills when they're looking for that future opportunity. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Have you thought about what you're going to do if you can't find people who are willing to pay you, what you're asking for um, coaching fees? What's going to be your revenue model for keeping your business afloat if you can't find enough people to pay your consulting fees. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really would like to then utilize um, the virtual um, opportunity if I can to develop ad sales um, through the blog and through um, YouTube and hopefully then gain traction to um, increase virtual coaching services for individuals and then definitely assessing my, um, my fees doing that. Gina, Gina could probably help you with that. <laughs> the reason I bring that up is because when I first started doing social media consulting like ages ago, I think it was probably 15 years ago, I was going to be a social media consultant. And uh, I realized people didn't know what social media was. <laughs> and they weren't willing to pay me to be a social media consultant. And I was like, oh, shit, I have to. I'm sorry. I was like, okay, so now I have to pivot. So then I became a social media trainer versus a consultant because people uh -huh. pay for training versus consulting. Yeah. 
Um, so then I started doing, um, bringing people into a room and doing training. And instead of paying $100 an hour, they were willing to pay $20 to sit in a class. So if you bring 15 people into a class, 15, 20 people into a class, you end up making your $100 an hour mm -hmm. because you've got your sell. I call it the Walmart model because now you're selling on bulk versus trying to get people to pay you $100 an hour. So, so thinking about that, if you, you know, you, you're going to have some people willing to pay you that, but you're not going to have people willing to pay you that. So being able to target a different group of people who can't afford to pay you the $75 an hour. So they can go after a different target group. Definitely. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And I, um, Don, I uh, go back to your question about use it like partnering up with the dream bank. Um, definitely. I think that's something that's on my radar of exploring more so that I can really build my brand um, locally. I think that's smart. I think, you know, right. With, with, you know, what Gina was saying is, you won't get people not always wanting to pay for that, but how do you also get the word out so they know how great you are and what you can do to help their business? I think there's a, a combination of the various models. All right. Nice job, Marley. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have Ime Eleni. Hello, everyone. I'm Ime Eleni. I'm piano and a Gujun teacher. Guzheng is a Chinese instrument. I just uh, show a little bit, please. found my dream. You can see the dream have a unicorn there. Next slide. <laughs> okay, the dream since I was 15 years old, 1995, the dream continued for two weeks now. So deep in my mind and clear and clear. For the dream, I created our logo. This logo, I uh, submitted the application at uh, March 19. You can see have a little girl uh, walking on the street to universe. Yes, Yulangwe's meaning is way to universe and the uh, line is uh, blue. So we have blue color for our company color. Next slide. Okay, really we're doing is we gave face-to-face um, -face piano lesson or guzhen lesson, painting lesson or dance lesson. Uh, then right now because of COVID-19, we move our facial class online Right now we're doing a lot of video, uh, use video for our students. This one, we don't have like a distant problem and uh, everyone can stay home, getting comfortable to start a music uh, education. Next slide. This picture is uh, since um, 1995, I have the dream to teach piano guzheng the music at uh, 2005. I registered two studio in China. This is all the students I have that time. At uh, 2005, I have um, piano students, maybe over 20, and the Guzheng students. This are kind of big opening day. From the left top corner, the red clothes is me. Next slide. Hmm. Here is the 2015. I'm at uh, Madison right now okay and that time is i with my student do the perform at the overture center next night right now we're building uh, the class we open more titles like piano guzheng the chinese letter and uh, the chinese painting dance lesson next night 
Uh, this is, I was performance on newspaper. Uh, one is Overture Center International Festival. Other one is performing at Nina uh, Elementary School, Middle School, and High School for the culture education. Next slide. That now is our team I'm introduced because I was always a self-employee working by myself. But right now, I'm building the team, building the company, Yulanwei. Uh, Eric is our um, musician. He recording and uh, com composer music, teach keyboard. And uh, Carl, she's um, our master degree um, computer engineer. She's do our website and she will teach Chinese in our company. Anisha, she's the same teacher. She's the MATC, my classmate. She's graduating yesterday. Congratulations, Anisha. And the um, other one is uh, Dave. He's teaching art class. Next slide. This is our product. Uh, for our company, we teach instrument that we sell instrument. Then so for the first one is kind of uh, some instruments kind of cheap, around twenty dollars. We can buy for fun. Everyone can hold the instrument and can start to play. It's a very simple instrument to start with. Then is twenty dollars start with. The middle is the harp. The harp is the price a little higher, around like hundred dollar, because I think it's reasonable for people who want to continue to learn more instrument. And our goal is the guzheng, is the by the right hand. This uh formal instrument, traditional Chinese instrument, uh, around uh, $400 above, $2,100. Uh, this instrument, uh, we have travel size. Is, uh, I just played this instrument for you. Kind of very beautiful, traditional Chinese instrument. Uh, you can see it in a lot of Chinese movie. It's very popular. We have a lot of students learning it in China. Right now, I have some students learning it American. I look forward to see more people interested in Chinese culture learning instruments with me. Next slide. Two minutes left. Okay. Okay, right now our company's big focus is our website. You can say the yulanwei.com. Yes, I'm glad I got this name <laughs> because it has special meaning. You in like a university, universe. You is work for you and use your way to building your style, go to universe. Right now for this um, um, website, we give free lessons. Um, we've already posted three class for free for the um, our students coming, just enjoying to take a look how we're doing our lessons. Then we can book one by one lessons, like a half hour lesson, 45 minute lesson, or one hour lessons. We have different price. Um, I think um, like a half hour lesson will run like $25. Uh, maybe cheaper for the very beginner. If they just uh, look at half of the video, half a lesson, we only charge $10 to start with to building our um, company. Uh, thank you, Medicine College. Let me have a chance to build my big dream. I will register my company very soon. I prepared a competition, sorry, application, application ready to send out. Thank you, everyone, to listen to my presentation. Thanks, Medicine College. Thank you. This is Jill here. Um, you mentioned some price points of $25 an hour or $10 an hour. And one thing I would just um, say to you is don't underestimate your talent and your skill with this. And I, if you were you able to do some research in terms of what other individual lessons per hour, what people charge in the area? Because I feel like that's probably on the lower end. And um, being musically inclined is a talent and a skill, and you don't want to underestimate your price per hour um, associated with that. Thank you. Yes, I've been thinking about this why I still not um, exactly post the price yet because I need to talk with my team member because we have musicians, but we have Chinese teacher. Chinese kind of nonprofits have a lot of school running, so we have hard uh, competition. The price can be low. But for music instrument, yeah, like you said, I should price higher a little bit. I know professional, like a professor for piano is $60 per hour. 
But I don't know how many people can pay from that whole package. Because if at uh, New York, I was have student from California, they, they think the price is no problem for them. But for medicine, because everyone, the income, especially have some from student, from UW student, the from Chinese money to American money, that's a lot <laughs> for them. So, and for the price, I'm still struggle. <laughs> I think you gave me the idea. Um, have you thought about how you are going to, um, are you taking one student at a time? Are you going to do group lessons? You know, in this new virtual world that we're constantly all living in, um, there could be an opportunity to um, multiply your expertise with a, a school of students at the same time. Yeah, that is a very good question. Uh, if you saw my picture, I was in China. I do one by one lesson for piano, but I do group lesson for Gujian the instrument. We have 10 students for one class. The problem is uh, I found a huge city in China. We have lots of students, and this student take this lesson, they can get a point for enter university or high school. So I have lots of parents who want to spend this money in this study. But in medicine, I want to create like a group lesson. But uh, sounds like a little difficult because first, uh, Gujian's like uh, unique instrument not everyone need. Piano does, but we have a strong competition. We have lots of teachers. And uh, I want to create a group lesson can help our research income, but uh, not really successful yet. Uh, only once in a while, when I do performance, I can group a student together to do group lesson, but mostly it's one by one. Especially right now is like online teaching class. Yeah, that's my goal to group people together. But Chinese class, this is, I plan for Chinese class, I group people together because they like, conversation to learn language. But for instrument, we still need more students. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ime. I enjoyed that. Thank you. Right. Next up, we have Jared Lensmeyer and his team. Yep. So, first of all, thank you for your time and uh, welcome to the Rig Tech's business presentation. My name is Jared Lensmeyer, one of the designers and the presenter for the Rig Tech team. On the next slide, these fine folks are my teammates and students of the mechanical design program. As such, we're all trained to make solutions in the form of functioning products. I, for one, have fond memories of uh, fishing up north of Winchester all the way when I was uh, 15. Many of my teammates have similar moments, either from childhood or with their kids, as in Ben's case. In addition, we have all had designing and manufacturing backgrounds. For me, I worked as a machinist for five years. Uh, Lucas worked with his family repairing and selling off-road vehicles. Dean had a previous internship at Madison Kip, and ben, ben graduated at MATC in machine tooling, as well as holding two years experience in mold making. Uh, Chandler currently has a job as a material handler at Duluth Trading. And as seen, we all have a passion for learning and discovering new ways to resolve today's issues, be they big or small. Next. During our second year here at MATC, we were presented a problem of, of efficiently storing a set of downriggers for one of our instructors. While developing a system, we found other exclusive equipment that could, that could benefit from easy access in fishing as well as in other sports. So we changed the goal to include storing other equipment related to outdoors, like planer boards for fishing. Unfortunately, COVID-19 forced us and everyone else to limit our physical presence on campus. Like so many other projects, we couldn't go out and talk with, other, with our customers to confirm our design would work. However, the job of the designer is to adapt the designs, and when we get the chance, we will have no issues in renovating our product to what our customers desire. Next. The rig, rack, the rig rack shown here is our latest design. The wall mounts are designed to attach to a wall, but could also attach to a bed of a truck or inside of a boat to better secure the equipment. The rack has inner slides that can be adjusted lengthwise to fit the wall mounts. Basically, while the rig rack is three feet long, 
the wall mounts don't have to be three feet apart to hold it, giving you some leeway in setting it up. When mounted, the rack is locked into place with set screws. Due to the design, it is very easy to detach the rack and get going with all your essential equipment in no time. The modules can be placed in any order desired and lock the, lock the equipment in place. Each module is designed for a specific tool rather than one size fits all. The intent is to hold your expensive equipment securely while being easy to access come the weekend. Modules shown here are designed around fishing, but on the next slide, this system could easily be adjusted to hold bows and arrow quivers for hunting, clamp skis and ski poles for skiing, secure paddles and life preservers for kayaking and canoeing, and so much more. We all have a hobby, something to help us relax after a busy week. For people to go outside and participate in sports, they need to have their equipment ready to go or else spend more time retrieving it from storage. Rig Tech aims to, to help outdoor sports enthusiasts have fun faster. Next. Because we aimed for fishing equipment initially, our market analysis aimed at fishing equipment sales, as people need storage solutions for these. As seen, sales are expected to rise, so there are people who still fish in these interesting times. Next. During our initial research, we found most equipment storage was either permanent shelving or stands that weren't meant to move. Our products will allow you to take your equipment wherever you want, whenever you want, safely and easily. Next. We will start out small and focus on fishing storage initially. We plan on making custom orders at $500 per unit as we market our product at conference booths or nearby lakes. Further along, we'll increase our production and range while dropping the price to $320 per unit. As of this estimate, the cost per unit is high, but when compared with the cost to buy and maintain sports equipment, we consider it a fair cost. For example, a single downrigger can cost from $150 to $300 or more, and people often buy more than two. Even so, our goal in designing and planning the production is to let people enjoy themselves sooner at a reasonable price. Next. So today's Friday, and after all these meetings are done, where are you going? When you're ready to go outside, be it for fishing or hunting, Rig Tech is ready to help you do what you love. Just ask. And I'm done. Well, I awesome. thought this was a really interesting concept. The one question I had, and I know you talked to talked about how obviously you ran into some um, issues with fully being able to vet due to COVID. But my big question was, have you been able to determine the interest for the product at this point? Um, Lucas, would you mind answering? Yeah, so I actually had a couple of uh, friends of mine, uh, including my neighbor, that I did talk to about this product. Um, he is a very big fisherman himself, and um, he did like the idea. He, he also um, struggles with the storage of his uh, units uh, from the boat to the garage to, the, to his basement. Um, so in, in, in that sense, uh, we do have some interest in that sense. Um, and I'm assuming, you know, other people would be interested as well, um, other big fishermen just like him. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, um, we could have a lot more information, but uh, we do have some feedback. Well, I, I love the design of it. I love the handle that you've added to it. That's awesome. Um, I was, I did have a question. Have you thought about patenting it? The, the the makeup of this because you or just at least getting the patent pending going uh, we haven't done that yet no um, it def definitely a lot of some of the components here uh, are worth patenting um, but I would say that we would need more feedback to uh, ensure that the product would be accepted further and if there are any other renovations that need to be made but uh, other than that no it's hasn't been as high on our list Jared, you guys do have a working prototype, right? Came out of mechanical design. Mm -hmm. What you saw there in the 3D uh, okay. CAD model is ba is basically it. Um, 
most of the components were made. Unfortunately, the setup is on uh, campus right now, so it's unavailable. I wasn't able to get any pictures into the slides, so. Yeah, no, I know. So, okay, well, we will, you know, pursuant to the patent um, thing, yeah, we'll, we'll need to talk more about that. And, and also Ron Olson, who I know you've been working with and take a further look at that. I think you guys have something here. Did you also have a question? Um, so is the intent then to sell pretty much direct to consumer then, or um, have an interest in this being picked up by, you know, some outdoors outfitter? You may have mentioned that, and maybe I didn't catch it in the presentation. Um, um, for initially, yeah, we intend to sell directly to the customer. So, a cut, um, we we get some interest. We get a, we give them a quote. Uh, we make it and we uh, ship it to them. But ideally, it'd be good to eventually make this into like a bunch of kits or like an online retail, and uh, work with some other outdoor outfits to uh, sell and in, and stock it. Yeah. You might even consider um, if you want to do more local research, partner with, you know, maybe, you know, maybe not the big box, but maybe some of the smaller um, fishing locations where people rent equipment, you know, just being able to get some more um, on the street market research might be something to think about. Okay. It's interesting. I've been reading um, some articles around um, what people are going to be do doing post COVID and it seems like there's going to be an increase of fishing and outdoor activities and that sort of thing. So I think the timing is really great for you in terms of what this looks like. And I love the product. Thank you. All right. Great job guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We're on to the last presentation for this morning, and that is Jennifer Hefferin. Hello, my name is Jenny Hefferin, and I'm the founder of Big Life Solutions. Big Life Solutions boosts happiness and supports the environment by helping customers make space at home for what's important. Big Life Solutions customers are those who struggle to find room for activities or belongings from comfortable spaces for working from home to places to store and organize hobby supplies, Big Life Solutions help customers live a big life no matter the size of the home. Next. Big Life Solutions is dedicated to solving the problem of where to put all the stuff for important activities and belongings. One of my favorite parts of the challenge was interviewing customers. As I interviewed them, I learned that many are overwhelmed and stressed out by their belongings. Their homes feel cluttered and closed in and they feel stuck. Their homes aren't functioning the way they would like. I heard of closet doors that won't open due to stuff in the way. And many said they're embarrassed about their homes. One said she won't even let people inside because of the mess. These customers feel they're prevented from living as full of a life as they would like to live. Next. I lived in Washington, D.C. for much of my adulthood in a 466 square foot studio apartment. I didn't want to compromise my life despite living in a small home. I wanted to be able to have people over and host dinner parties. So I found ways to make my apartment function as if it were much larger and discovered that I have a love and a talent for maximizing space. As I was moving here, I hired a carpenter to do some repairs and he said he wished he could hire me to design solutions for his clients. That led to my epiphany. I realized there was a demand for my skills. I'm currently in the cabinet making program at Madison College in learning how to construct the space saving features I love to design. Next. To help customers, Big Life Solutions offers a variety of services. In the short term, I'm offering consulting in two key areas and testing my minimum viable product. I'm helping customers select furniture and storage solutions. For example, one of my first customers is a mom with two kids, all working and attending school from home. I'm helping her identify furniture she could purchase to make a small corner of her living room function as her kid's school space. I'm offering assistance in organizing and decluttering. And once the Safer at Home order is lifted, I'll also help design and build to create custom built-ins and furniture to organize customers' lives, allow rooms to serve multiple purposes, and to help customers achieve a feeling of spaciousness and calm. 
next. To give a better sort of the idea of the sorts of work I can do, these photos are from my DC apartment. On the right side, you can see a breakfast bar, which is where I sat to eat meals each day. However, I wanted to be able to host dinner parties. So I designed that breakfast bar to hide a gate lake table. Gate lake table is a table that folds away to save space. When it was time to have a dinner party, I moved that table into the middle of the room. Next slide. Here you can see the table moved to the middle of the room. I could host dinner parties for six with folding chairs I kept stored in a closet. Behind the table, you can also see my Murphy bed. While I didn't design this piece of furniture, it was key to allowing my, function to, my, allowing my apartment to function as if it were much larger. The two center bookcases were on sliders and slid to either side, revealing the bed, which you could then pull down. Next. Finally, I'd like to share this bench that I made to hide the cat litter box. This allowed me to keep the cat litter box in my living room or hallway, yet keep it hidden from sight. I would like to know that I made this bench before I learned woodworking, and if I made it today, it would be much higher quality. These are the examples of the sorts of solutions I offer customers. Currently working on designing a kitchen storage bench for parents of four kids who live in a small three bedroom home and can't find a larger home within their price range, and also an entry storage cabinet for a historic home. Next slide. The home organization and remodeling industries have been booming in recent years. Customers spend billions on these, in these areas. While the pandemic may result in decline spending on home organization and remodeling, it's also significantly increased the amount of time people spend at home, and many are finding their existing furniture and organization is inadequate. Interviews conducted as part of the challenge show the demand for these services continues despite the pandemic and Big Life Solutions has obtained its first three customers since beginning the challenge. Word of mouth will be important for drawing in new clients. Big Life Solutions will also develop a strong social media presence, particularly on Instagram, which is important in this industry. As work ramps up, Big Life Solutions hopes to reach more potential customers at home and remodeling expos and conventions. Next slide. Two minutes left. Big Life Solutions is starting out lean. Initial work is consulting only, and so key initial costs will be for the website and domain. But once the Safer at Home order lifts and design build projects begin, key costs will include insur insurance and membership at the Baudry, which is a makerspace. This is key to starting my business as it would not be feasible to rent a workshop and obtain all the necessary tools and equipment without a very large financial investment. As the company grows, I'll have an opportunity to rent affordable private studio space at the Baudry. An eventual goal is to have private workshops and tools, but that will likely be at least a few years down the line. Consulting services will be charged on a flat fee for service model with a variety of packages available. Before project design, Big Life Solutions will collect a fee for design services. Built projects will be charged on a cost plus basis and a sizable percent of each fee will be put towards materials for each project, such as lumber, fasteners, and hardware. Next slide. Big Life Solutions is excited to grow beyond the existing three customers and help people find space at home for what's important. I wanna thank Scott Cole and the Madison College Challenge for the opportunity to present in the, participate in this program. And I wanna thank you for all of your time and attention this morning. I look forward to hearing your feedback on my business idea. Um, hi, Jenny. This was this is a great idea. I love it. Um, I saw two items listed under your marketing plan, and I'm just wondering. I see a lot of. I watch a lot of tiny homes shows, <laughs> and I was just wondering. You you might have thought about this already. Providing um, consulting services to folks who build tiny homes, um, because they're often looking for folks to help them put that put their tiny homes together so and then of course folks who renovate their rvs um things like that so uh, are you looking into that those possibilities i i do think that's very a very real possibility however i'm most interested in kind of taking the lessons from tiny homes 
and applying them to people who live in regular sized homes. Okay. Um, because I think the market is a lot bigger, but I certainly wouldn't say no to helping people in, in tiny homes and RVs. I think that's, that would definitely be something. Even boats, actually. Um, I have a cousin who's interested in my help on her, on her boat, her sailboat that she's been living on. <laughs> Well, there is definitely a need for your service. Um, I think you may end up finding that you're going to be busier than you think because <laughs> all of us are all sticking at home going, oh my God, I can just look around my office and go, I need somebody. <laughs> How will you handle uh, the volume of business? Because it sounds like it's just you right now. And so with that, you're limited to what you can do. Have you thought about how to multiply, like put yeah. together or something? It's funny because I, you know, at this point, it, it doesn't, I, yeah, that's a good question and I haven't really thought about it. I, I do think that I could eventually hire staff and grow. Um, and, and I think if, if there is a lot of interest, I will need to do that. Um, you know, I'd like to start out lean, but I, I will need to kind of constantly assess. Um, I think you could even put just some video, um, some vlogs together, just, um, highlighting your talents because I love what you shared I'm like that was awesome about what you had done with your 400 or a little over 400 square foot apartment and so use that as a way to help people get notoriety and know how who you are thank you I really liked the idea I heard you say when you were just talking a little bit about a cost plus model so one of the things when I was reading the plan that I was wondering is what is the cost of the service? So can you maybe elaborate on that just a little bit more? I, I haven't actually priced out my, um, my services, but I've done a little bit of research from what other companies are doing. Um, like for example, there's another company that kind of does web-based furniture selection and you know, they start at, at $500 and then it goes up from there. Um, so I'm kind of using that as a model, but I, you know, that balance of not undervaluing my time, but not wanting to be expensive and out of reach, I, you know, I have to figure that out. So Jenny, I, I love this concept and I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you mentioned that you already had three customers that's Can right. Just talk a little bit about that and talk about maybe um, what you did for those customers and what their feedback was for you. Well, so I haven't completed for any of them yet. Um, but the, the first is the, that storage bench I mentioned for the kitchen. It's, it's a family of six living in a three bedroom home and they need every inch of storage they can get. Um, I can't, I can't design it or build it right now because I don't have access to the Baudry. <laughs> Um, but you know, so I'm going to be building them a storage bench for their kitchen, for their dining room table. So she can find, store her, um, canning supplies and other things. Um, and then another client is wanting a, a cabinet near their, their entry door to place to put coats and, and shoes when they come in the house. So I'll be designing that. And then the, the third client, um, is, actually just, and, and that one's the one that the work that will be done soonest, selecting that um, office space for kids who are going to school at home right now. Um, and literally, she just wants help knowing what to buy from Ikea that will work best in her room. Um, but so I don't have any feedback yet other than, you know, um, input on what they want. It, it reminds me like that could be a whole nother, especially in this remote time, um, a whole nother platform where you create virtual coaching and you um, help people virtually, like they show you, show you their space virtually, you come up with idea suggestions, put together even where they can buy those items so that people would pay for that consulting. Exactly. Thank you. I've got to chime in. I've got to do it. Okay. So what I'm hearing in my mind, like, uh, Jenny, you're, you're not just improving the home, but you're also improving maybe the workflow of the home and how the home operates. 
this, what would you do if some company said, I have 40,000 square feet, and I have to make this workflow uh, more efficient? Would you say, okay, or would you say, no, I'm sticking to homes? That's a really good question. I don't know what I would say. I'd have to, I'd have to think about it. <laughs> Maybe. That, that could be a whole another opportunity for expansion, Jenny. So yeah. I think it's a good suggestion for, for certain yeah. and, and likely to happen at some point, I think, as you get going. So awesome. Any other questions for Jenny? Okay, great job. So well, that brings us to, uh, to the conclusion of this year's challenge. Um, I don't want to get too long winded here, but I, I can tell you that after doing this eight times now over eight years, um, collectively, this is this is absolutely one of the best groups of pitches that we have seen. Um, we, we, we set out we kind of revamp it this year saying, can we get a, a different mix uh, a little bit? And it's by far the best mix of different business ideas, product ideas that we have seen. And after listening to all nine of you, I think you all have an opportunity to do something really cool. Uh, absolutely. So, um, so you guys have come this far and it's been a joy to work with you to get here. Um, your work is not done, not by a long shot. Uh, but what we will be doing is you'll each be getting a check coming in the mail shortly. I know Kelsey's been working on getting everything squared away for that. So thank you so much, Julie, to Summit and on to Task for making that possible that we can award everyone some cash to keep this moving. Um, so please keep reaching out. Uh, if you haven't talked to Gina, uh, if you haven't talked to Brian Lee, you all know Scott because you've been working with Scott for the past seven weeks, but those are some other really great folks in our, in our mix that can help you move this along. I know that Julie would be happy to sit, and her team would be happy to sit down with any of you that maybe are in a position to need some financing coming up. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, this has been super fun. I want to say thanks to Scott for really guiding this team for the last seven weeks. We didn't know how this would work. I think it worked better in, in, in a super challenging environment. This would have been, you know, new and, and challenging um, if we didn't have any complications, but to do it virtually, Scott, thank you very much for pulling this off. Um, Kelsey, thank you for all the logistics, you bet. Uh, Gina, thank you for all your help over the last year as our entrepreneur in residence and great feedback today. Um, and I, I think uh, Don, Julie, these folks, if, you're, if you guys are open to it, I'd encourage them to ping more ideas off of you as they keep going, if that's okay with you guys. Please do, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Rosalie, it was, you reminded me of the very first Madison College challenge that we had where, I'm just gonna say it, Purple Cow Organics came and I was like, wow, this is like a whole nother iteration. So I think just seeing the evolution of where businesses go is amazing. So I'd love to help even connect you with right folks, answer questions, be there to support any of you. Awesome, okay. Anyone else want to make any uh, concluding remarks at all? Floor Good job, open. everybody. Okay. I'm proud of everyone. Well done. Well done. Thank you all. So now what? <laughs> You're doing it. <laughs> You're not done. Yeah, you got a long way to go. Down the threshold. <laughs> So now we keep working, we'll be in touch. So look for your check coming. And uh, Scott and Jill and I and Kelsey with Gina will talk about next steps for each of you and reach out um, and include Julie and Don as we can. Or like I said, feel free to ping them. Keep it going, so. Thank you, Brian, Kelsey, Scott, Gina. Appreciate you, the coordination. Good job, everyone. Appreciate Have a wonderful it. holiday, everyone. You too. Be well. You too. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Again. Bye. Thank you. Bye.